So my name is Casey, and I get to be your pastor. Uh, I get to be Cole's dad, Caroline's dad, Cade's dad, Cora's dad, and um, lots of other things, but uh, I, I love getting to serve as one of your pastors. And uh, we're really excited because not only is today the family service, but it's the kickoff of Advent. Um, and so Advent is uh, the, the season where we prepare our hearts. We kind of do this thing where we look back to when Jesus first came as a little baby, and we also look forward to this time when Jesus is coming again as a king. And then we ask ourselves the question, like, what do we do now? How should we live now? What is our proper response knowing that we, we, have, we have Jesus who has come and he's coming again, so now how shall I live? And we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna explore this through the idea of thriving and what does it look like to thrive in things that, that we get as Christians. Uh, and, and so in order to help me kick this off, we've got one more of our, of our youth that's going to come on up. This is Brandon. And Brandon's going to come up and he's going to read our scripture today. I'm going to light the Advent candle because each week we, we light a consecutive candle that goes with a theme. Let's give it up for Brandon. Brandon's going to be reading from Isaiah 9. I'm going to go over there and light our Advent candle. So prepare your hearts to start thinking about hope. Go ahead, bud. Well, it's not working. Oh, I think you're, I think you're live now. Oh. Uh, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he, he humbled the land of, uh, I don't know how to say it. Um, and the land of Nephtali. I don't really know how to say it either, so you're good, yeah. you're good. <laughs> but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations, but by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nations and increased their joy. They rejoice uh, before you as people rejoice at a harvest, as warriors rejoice by dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Mad Madonna's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod upon the oppressors. Every warrior's boots used in battle have every, and every garment rolled in blood uh, will be des designed for burning um, will be fuel and will be fuel for the fire for to us a child is born to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful uh, counselor mighty God everlasting father and Prince of Peace of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time and on forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The Lord has sent a message against Jacob. It will fall on Israel. All the people will know it. Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria will say with pride and arrogance of heart, yeah. That's good stuff. That's good stuff right there. All right. Well, I hope that you guys are ready um, to receive an infusion of hope uh, because that's where we're starting uh, this Advent season is looking at our hope. And we're going to do that through Isaiah 9. And uh, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. We're going to be digging a little bit deeper as we walk through this. But a couple of things that will set us up in our, in our time today. Um, the first one is this. Uh, like, like I said before, Advent. W what are we doing here in Advent? Well, Advent is a season where we look back and we also look forward, okay? So we're looking back to the birth of Christ. We're super amped about that. Uh, we, like the whole world actually acknowledges that. It's so cool that like the whole world actually stops and acknowledges Jesus, whether they will say it or not. Like, like it's a world stopper. You don't get many of those. Uh, but, but it's not just looking back. Advent is also um, what, what's coming. 
what's coming. And we're, we're asking ourselves, how do we thrive as we find ourselves in the in-between? When Jesus is coming again, but he's already come. And so, you know, just, just real quick, I, I looked up what the word thriving means. And uh, it means to prosper and to grow vigorously. Man, I want that. I, w- I want to prosper. I want to grow vigorously in hope. I want to do that in joy. I want to do that in peace. And I want to do that in love. And that's our prayer that God would give us that during this particular season. So let's go to him and ask him to do that. And then let's lean in together as we look at hope today. Father, we ask that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, God, and you would give us hope. We cannot manufacture it, no matter how pumped I might be about it, God. It will not come to life unless your Holy Spirit breathes it into us. So we make ourselves available. I turn my hands even over to you right now. I invite those of us who are here today who want more hope, just to turn their hands up and over to you, Father. And we pray, we pray, come, Holy Spirit, come. Christ in your name, amen, amen. I love this quote. I think it's a great, great, great place to start from um, Melissa Kruger, and this is what she writes. As believers, we look back, but we also look forward just as our children delight in the remembrance of past Christmas joys, they also look forward to what awaits them under the tree. More is yet to come. Say that with me. More is yet to come. As his people, we look back and remember that Christ has come and redeemed the world. That's, that's part of the gospel. That, that you, me, we're all sinners. We all deserve hell, separation apart from a holy and righteous God. But he, not only is he holy and righteous, but in his holy and righteousness, he has this passionate love for us where he will not leave us separated. He chases after us and he creates a way for us to be reconciled to him. Christ comes, he lives a perfect life and he dies the death that you and I should have died. With your sin and mine placed upon him, he dies on the cross on the third day after receiving the full brunt of God's wrath for my sin, Jesus comes back. He's like, I don't need that grave anymore. Those days are done. I've overcome Casey's sin. I've overcome your sin. And now you can get in on that. You can be forgiven of your sin if you will receive Christ as your treasure, as your Savior, as your Lord by faith. It's just a move of faith saying, I'm done being my own treasure, my own Lord, and my own Savior. I'm turning from that life. And Jesus, I'm I'm just, I'm committing to you. I'm trusting you. You're enough. That's, the, that's, that's part of the gospel. The good news that we can be forgiven and accepted by God through faith in Christ. But listen to me. Listen to me. If you've never listened to me before, please listen to me during Advent at least. More is yet to come. If I can get one thing to you, if I could just like, here you go. I would tell you that more is yet to come. That for, for, the, for those of us who have received the forgiveness of Christ, the adoption into the family of God, if you haven't received that through faith, more is yet to come, but it's not good more. It's the wrath of God more. And, and you, you shouldn't thrive in hope. That would, you'd be faking it. Or you'd be thriving in things that aren't going to last you. And I would invite you to turn from those things and trust in Christ and Christ alone, even, even right now in this moment, by the power of the Holy Spirit. But for those of us, as Melissa writes, and as we'll see today, for those of us who have trusted in Christ, more is yet to come. And the good news is that, yes, we, forget, we, we experience forgiveness now, but Jesus is coming back to restore all things. He's coming back to right the wrongs of the shootings and the racism and the poverty and the anxiety and the depression and the addiction and the babies that we have to bury and all the, all the crazy brokenness of today. He's coming back and he will right the wrong. Jesus promises that he will right the wrong. He is renewing all things, all the hurts of our heart. Jesus is renewing. And so more is yet to come. The gospel is that, that good. She finishes by saying, as his people, we will look back and remember that Christ has come and redeemed the world. We look forward and hope 
for the day when he will come again, making all things new. More is yet to come. More is yet to come. Now listen, I, I, I've got a thing going on in my head right now. I just want to get it out. Is that okay? Sometimes it's better to get the things in your head out. I'm <laughs> preaching. So I realize that we're in a mixed crew. We've got younger and we've got older. And sometimes I don't necessarily always remember that the younger are with us. So I might have just said something that was kind of like, whoa, that's kind of heavy to throw out with kids in the crowd. I'm sorry. And I don't mean that like I'm sorry, like, like get over it. No, I mean like I'm sorry. I, I kind of lose myself sometimes. So I'm going to try to do my best to remember we're in a mixed crowd and that um, I, I have to be careful of how heavy we go here because I don't want to do damage to our up and coming. Is that, are you guys with me on that? Okay, so I'm going to keep going, if that's cool, and not, and not dwell on if I said something wrong. Good? All right, those of you who know me, please nod and say, keep going. All right, cool. Great, great. More is yet to come. Yeah, more is yet to come. I love this guy. All Advent series, you've got to sit right there. Thriving in Hope, Isaiah 9. Um, so we're going to walk through this here uh, in, in a couple of the different verses, um, and we'll just kind of take our time, and um, not too much time, though, I, again, I do realize we've got, we've got kids with us, but uh, there's some things that I think God wants us to see here. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish, Isaiah 9.1. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea. I think we keep going, right? We go. The land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Next one. So hopelessness is a real thing. Hopelessness is a real thing. Let me give you a little bit of context here. Okay, so Isaiah is a prophet. You had a couple, you had like three different offices in the Old Testament. You had prophet, priest, and king. Um, kings kind of told people where they were headed. Let's go conquer this mountain. Priests were with the people. They, were, they walked along slowly with the people. They offered sacrifices for the people. And the priests like talked to God on behalf of the people. They were like for the people. Prophets talked to the people on behalf of God. And that's what we've got here in Isaiah. We've got a prophet. And he's speaking to the people on, be, on behalf of God. And, and here's, here's the context. Um, you, you've, got, you've got God's people, right? The Israelites. Uh, but by this time, they had broken into two different types of people. Um, we, you've got the Judah on the south, and you've got um, Israel, if you will, on, on the top. And um, this, this prophet, he, he speaks to both. But, but primarily in this particular passage, he's going to talk to the northern, the northern people, if you will. They're a divided kingdom, so that's not great. But, but he's talking to the northern people, and he's like, um, basically he's talking about the Assyrians and, and how the Assyrians um, will come in and conquer these people because of their disobedience. And um, eventually, God redeems his people out of that captivity, uh, but just to set the, the context for you, it's not a good captivity. I mean, no captivity is good. None of you have ever said, wow, that was such an enjoyable time in, in like prison. I loved having another master that told me what to do and what I couldn't do. No matter, no matter how kind that master is, if that master is not Jesus, essentially that master is not life-giving. And so the Assyrians, um, in, the, in the captivity of, of Israel, it, it came in two different waves. Um, it wasn't pleasant. It wasn't pleasant. Not only were many of the Israelites taken away from their land, taken captive by force, but also the land was, um, you might call, implanted with people who were not Israelites. They would later become known as the Samaritans. So if you know anything about the Good Samaritan and how people felt about Samaritans, there, there's a lot of history here that comes in from them like not being fully Jewish in the, in the mind of Jewish people. And, and, and so this was not a good time for Israel. This was not one of Israel's like awesome moments in history where they were like behind King David conquering land or going into the promised land or, no, no, no. This is them being conquered out of disobedience. And so the fact that he talks about gloom and darkness and all those sort of things, that's a real thing. Now he says there's, there's this light that's coming, 
and, and he talks about Galilee, and the commentators that I was reading says this is a direct reference to Jesus because we see that much of Jesus' ministry was around the Galilean area. So we're seeing a book that's written, let's say, maybe approximately 700 years before Jesus is already starting to point very directly to Jesus. But let's not hop to Jesus before we spend just a little bit of time in the hopelessness of the situation. When you're in captivity, you do not get a vote. There's not a bunch of dialogue. There's not much concern for your freedom, uh, your comfort, your flourishing or thriving as a person. Your identity is you are owned and operated by somebody else. You're dominated. Captivity means that you are under the oppression of somebody else. In Assyria, well, they, they were not like your, your friendly neighbor, just to put it lightly, in our family service, right? They were not, wasn't good. So, so having a real sense of, of helplessness or hopelessness, that was, a, that was a, like a real thing for God's people. Man, I'm just wondering today, how many of you are, you can, you can like affirm that? So hopelessness is a real thing. It's like, yeah, maybe you've been there. Maybe you're there right now. Maybe you know. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's almost better for you to be there than to watch a family member be there. Sometimes. You know, like it's just, every situation is different. But like, like we're, we're familiar with hopelessness, correct? We're familiar with that feeling of like, I'm not, I, you can't see my chains but I, I'm not getting out until my master says it's okay. And, and that is a real, that's a real thing for, <laughs> for God's people. Hopelessness, hopelessness is a real thing for God's people. I know sometimes we want to be quick to run to Jesus and triumph and we're more than conquerors and all those, those sort of things are true. But do you know who they are true for? People who embrace their hopelessness. I don't know if that preaches well. Some of you are nodding. Some of you are like, you gotta explain that more. I don't know how that hits you, but I know how it probably hits uh, many people who have walked through recovery from drugs and alcohol. Where they, they, there's a point where until they can embrace their hopelessness, hope does not make sense. Hope does not get to break in until they fully embrace the desperation of their situation, which is why it's called a gift. I was reading an article from, um, uh, it's Harvest is the, uh, the, the website, I believe, and, uh, and it deals with purity and integrity and things like that. And, and one, of the, one of the things that the writer was saying uh, talked about um, our uh, helplessness is like a, is like a key to, to hopefulness because it gives you humility. It gets you to the end of yourself so you can start looking elsewhere. Because, because I think one of the great diseases, at least of the culture that I've grown up in, is that I can do it. Like essentially, there's, a, there's like a shred left of self-reliance that I am going to work through my fill in the blank. And until I release that shred, the hopefulness that this passage and the whole scripture talks about, it doesn't really capture me the way it's meant to. It's almost like there's this competition for, for where are you going to place your hope? And what was really cool about the article is it, it, it continued on and it started talking about like, like maybe and quite possibly and probably God is indefinitely actually as he makes the cases God is not concerned with your perfect record he's more concerned with you growing in dependence upon him in intimacy upon what he can do in and through you not how awesome you've been doing over the last two to three months years fill in the blank and it's like it's like you know that song um uh, reckless love 
There's no mountain, I won't sing it, but you know what I'm saying. Like, it's like God keeps chasing after you and he keeps knocking down walls. And, he, and I think for me, in my walk with anxiety, I have this, like, if you, if you know Jacob, he wrestled with God. I, I'm not, I don't look like a good wrestler. <laughs> but I feel like I have this wrestle fast with God over where my hope's gonna come from especially when like anxiety, the darkness of anxiety rolls in. And I, I, I still believe, and God is chasing me, this is what I'm trying to say. I think God is chasing after me to release the grip that I have on the fact that I can figure this thing out. I can think my way out. I can memorize my verses way out. I can pray my way out. I can read my Bible my way out. To say, those are all good things, buddy. But I'm gonna keep coming after you till it's just about me until you're hopeless enough to let me be your one true hope. I think that's what he's been telling me. And I think that for many of us this morning, that's maybe what he wants to tell us. And so hopelessness is a real thing, and it's, it's also your friend in the gospel. Hey, Let's keep, at least keep going. The, the passage continues in verse 3. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. Next, okay, so something good's coming. What's coming? For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. Hold on. Okay, so what, what Isaiah is saying is like it's not going to last forever what we've got going on here. It's not going to last forever. Like, God's going to do something. He's going to come in, and, and, and he's going he's to break, he's going to break the, the people who have you oppressed. He's not going to leave you in this state. He, re, he references Midian. This is, um, if, if you know anything about Gideon, this is a reference to Gideon's battle. You remember Gideon? You may remember Gideon. He was, a, he was like a beast. You should like look him up, okay? This guy was awesome, and, and like what, he, what God accomplished through a little, and he it did so much. It was, it was cool. It was so awesome. And, and so he's referencing, hey, like that's going to happen again. Keep going, please. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for fire. So like it's over. Whatever, like the, the struggle is going to be over one day. It's, there, the, there's going to be a, an end to this thing. Keep going. Ah, yeah. This is the part we love. This is the part we know. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Like, this, by the way, will never change your life besides maybe give you a good, warm, tingly feeling on the inside and advent until you come to grips with your hopelessness. You understand that, right? That's why we've spent, I don't know how long, but like we've spent enough hopeful time like, like helping you to understand <laughs> like the Israelites back then, when you're in captivity, you're looking for any shred of hope, even if it's crazy like a baby boy. Whatever, give it to me. Okay, great. It, like, like, when somebody's holding you down underwater and you begin to see some, like, ray of hope, it's like, okay. It's, it's my hope that the Spirit is helping you to see this as your hope. As like, yes, give me more. Something more is yet to come. And this is what it is. For to us a child is born and a son is given. The government, okay, so there's going to be some, some sort of shift here. Next slide. Question. So hope is a baby boy. Interesting. So hope is a baby boy. Again, we look at Isaiah and we have to see that in, in prophetic books, oftentimes what would be prophesied, and it depends on the prophecy, it would, it would be happening in, in the near future of that particular author, but it would also be pointing to what Jesus would ultimately fulfill. And, and we see this very clearly announcing Jesus again. That he's not going to come first time as a conquering king. He's not going to ride in on the white horse. That's coming. That's scene two. Scene one, 
Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus is ever born, talks about how God will enter the world, how hope will enter the world. He will enter the world not as a teenager, not as a, like a prophetic speaker, not as this uh, gladiator, like, like warrior guy with marks and like, like Spartan race type guy. Like none of that. Not there's anything wrong with that, Spartan racers. Here's, here's how he enters. He enters as a baby boy. So hope is a baby boy. Isaiah's very clear that our hope is a person. Our hope is not an idea. It's not a bumper sticker. It's, it's not something you throw on the wall. It's not a philosophy. It's not a chapter. It's a person. Hope is warm. Hope has emotion. Hope can, can feel and touch. Hope, you can have a relationship, a real relationship with this type of hope. But just as important as all those things is this idea that hope is actually not you. You are not your hope. Your hope is outside of you. Because none of you are baby boys except for Henry. I know we have a couple baby boys in here. But they're not it either. Hope is outside of us. And what exactly does this hope look like? Let's keep going. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Hey, hold on just a second here. So, so this is, this is kind of what to look for. We should look for our hope to be someone, someone that can actually lead us and, and counsel us and guide us. That's awesome. He's not just a counselor. He's a wonderful counselor. It's like he's a divine counselor. He's got, a, this word counselor is translated like a plan. He's the guy with the plan, and it's a wonderful plan. Maybe we're familiar with Jeremiah where it talks about, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and give you all these like, like cool things, and I'm, I'm for you, and I'm with you. Well, we have a counselor in our hope that's a baby boy named Jesus that, that is, that is for, not only for you, but he's got this beautiful plan for your life. What else should we look for? Mighty God. So when we look at our hope, we, we begin to see that our hope doesn't just have these awesome plans for us, but that our hope actually has the power to pull them off. I think sometimes I get tripped up in the, in the sense of like, yes, Jesus, you are the resurrection and the life to come, but how does that affect my situation now? Like, do you have the goods right now? Because what I'm dominated by is what I feel here and what I think. Are you more powerful than that? Like, you got to show up. And so sometimes this is where I can personally fall down and say, I got this, but like, are you, are you God enough, Jesus to come through in this situation, again, I know you've never failed me. I know I've never been put to shame by trusting in you, but what about today? Everlasting Father. Okay, so he's, he's connected to the Father. He's not the Father, but there's a connection to the Father. He's divine, and he, and he brings the Father's heart with him. Prince of Peace. This is the guy, if he's a prince of peace, that means that not only does he have peace for himself, but he has peace to give you. He has the authority to give you peace. Peace between you and God, peace between one another, peace for yourself. Next slide, please. So hope has a name. So hope has a name. His name is Jesus. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Those are, the, those are the characteristic. Those are, those are the things that name him and set him apart as our hope. How awesome would it be to live with that type of hope pervading your everyday existence all the time? His counsel, his power, his heart for other people and for the Father. Like him fully thriving in you with peace. That is the hope that we are called to in this passage and that Christ fulfills. Let's keep going and finish. Verse 7, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom. Next slide. To establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth 
and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So this is an everlasting hope. This is a hope that not only changes things, it's a hope that we can be secure in because there is no end to this hope. It is a hope that will, you know how we call Jesus the King of kings and the Lord of lords? That's because when his government does come to reign, when his kingdom actually does come to reign in fullness in his second coming, everything will be shifted and the government will truly be on his shoulders. And as a matter of fact, as we adopt babies and as we fight for equality, as we fight against poverty, as we fulfill those things on the Christmas tree, as we care for our children and kingdom kids, his kingdom is actually advancing and coming more and more and more. And it reminds the world that one day it will come in completion. Amen? That is what you want to give your life to if you have an appetite for hope. Because as you're a part of his coming and advancing kingdom, hope begins to rise in your own heart. And how will this get accomplished? The zeal of the Lord, like the passion of God, is going to accomplish this, not your passion. Next slide, please. So hope is a king. So hope is a king. And as we think about today and thriving, let's go to the next slide, thriving in, in, this, in this hope, Isaiah tells his audience what to do. In chapter 10, he's like, be not afraid, for in just a little while, God's going to deliver you. And God did. God delivered them. And it lasted just a little while. It was like Isaiah was saying, but more is yet to come. The king who has control and authority to do all this is coming, and in just a little while, he will come. The question is, but what about Now, next slide. What about thriving today? How do I thrive in this hope? How does this hope go from something that was like really cool to hear about for the Israelites and something I'm tasting faintly to something that I'm like prospering in and growing vigorously in? What would that look like for me today? And this is where we'll kind of kind of conclude and give you guys some things to, to walk away with and, and be practical with. Um, some, some thoughts about what, what this might look like. Uh, an equation. Remember, let's, let's show that equation, please. So, so here's kind of the equation um, to thriving in hope, if you will. This is what it might look like to thrive in hope. Remembering what has come, Okay, so I know that, that Jesus has come and he's died for my sins and he's, he's been resurrected and I can be forgiven through faith. So, so that's, a good, that's a good start. And I'm remembering that there's something else coming. There's, there's more coming. The best is actually yet to come. So that's cool. I think it's, um, I forget his first name, but D- Dupree, I think is the author, who says it's the leader's first job to define reality. So that's, that defines reality for you. It places you where you are in the in-between. Jesus has come, and this is what he's done, and and he's coming again, and this is what he will do. But I feel like for me, I don't really thrive in hope until I get that third part of the equation. And again, like, so now I'm gonna gonna talk to you a little bit about experience and and how this has been working out for me. There's a third part to that equation that, that is in addition to simply remembering the past of what Christ has done and, re- and, and remembering that he's coming again. Let's check it out. Next slide, please. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Does anybody know what Emmanuel means? God with us. Emmanuel. Hey, let's finish our time just by talking about this one idea of experiencing Emmanuel. Experiencing Emmanuel. So I did a study for an academic pursuit I was um, a part of about two years ago now. And uh, I did a study on our church. And the study uh, took us through um, this, this concept of how does a local church uh, help people who have, uh, I think it was a year of sobriety, um, 
basically stay sober. Um, what are, what, are some of the, what are some of the things that a local church can do for somebody who has experienced a year of sobriety, uh, but, but like they're, they're continuing their journey? So I did a deep dive, um, and I just did research and study and all these sort of things uh, on, on this particular topic. And, and one of the coolest findings uh, from the people that I studied was that the, there was a few, but, but one of the things that allowed them to continue in their sobriety and... and I would say really flourish, is they had access to like a real living Jesus. It wasn't just a, a thought they remembered. It wasn't just something they like, con- like kind of conjured up and forced themselves to think back about or think. It wasn't a mental exercise necessarily. It was an actual experience. They, they had access to like um, a Jesus that essentially was more powerful than their desire to go back out. Experiencing Emmanuel. You know, I think the only time, speaking from my own personal walk in, in, in something that has become dark and at times feels crippling uh, to me, to some degree, is my anxiety. And, and the only, I feel, like, I feel like some of the greatest forward movement is not just when I'm remembering, although that's important, but when I'm actually experiencing God with me. So if I want to thrive in hope, I I have to ask the question, how do I get that? I don't know what it is for you. It might not be an addiction. It might not be the darkness of the kind of soul when those clouds roll in, whether it's mental stuff, whatever. It might be something in your family, job, whatever. Like, like, but but how is it that in, in... in the reality of this broken world, we can actually really, in real time, thrive in hope. Last few thoughts. John 15 talks all about, um, and we'll go to the next slide, please. Talks all about uh, abiding. And Jesus is saying, basically, you, you can't do anything outside of me. Like, I'm like, if you want to do anything of significance, if you want to do anything, you got to abide in me. It's all about abiding. And um, go back one slide, please. Awesome. So good. Uh, sorry, I didn't see it at the bottom there. Thanks. And I didn't mean go back like all bossy. Sorry, Dave. Dave's awesome. Can we give it up for Dave? I love Dave. Ask him his story. It's, it's a story filled with hope. So I meant go back, please, please, Dave, please. And look how big he is. He can crush me. You don't want to boss that guy around. Anyways, he wouldn't, though, because he's a man of gentleness and hope. <laughs> Experiencing Emmanuel. How does, how does that, like, work out? How does that work out? Oh, are you just messing with me now, Dave? I want, yeah, that's the one I want right there. He's playing games with me right now. <laughs> Reading and rehearsing. Reading and rehearsing. So, you know, like I kind of think in word, um, you know, I forget, is it called alliteration when they all start with the same one, reading? So, so on your outline, there's four of them, and maybe we'll, we'll highlight a couple of those along the way in this journey called A Season to Thrive. But today, I want to highlight just one, and that's, that's rehearsing. I'm going to ask the team to come on up. Team, would you guys come on up, and we're going to get ready to close. And so... Remembering is important, and that's the first one I put on your outline. You do have to remember where you are. You're in between. We're in the in-between. Well, the second one is reading. The third one is rehearsing, and the last one is resting. And so I want to tell you this, that um, it's important. It's so important to read your word. Like, I don't know how. I'm not sure and I would be open to learn, but I just would be skeptical the whole time, to, to have somebody tell me that they've experienced God with them birthing hope inside of their souls outside of reading his word. Like, I don't know how you do that. Because, um, like, like this, is a, this is a living document. And what God does through this document is, is he tells you things that are true, and then by the power of the Holy Spirit makes them come to life in your soul. Hope is one of those things. So reading your word during this Advent season is going to be radically huge. Radically huge. Just, just even go home and read the passages that we read today and I referenced today. Most of them should be in your outline. 
Spend time, think about them. Read. But that's not the only thing I, I think of when I, when I think of reading. I, th- I believe you also have to read yourself. You have, to be, you have to grow in mindfulness of actually what's going on inside of you. What are you believing? What are you not believing? So it's not just reading the word, it's also reading yourself and, and reading where your heart is prone to wander because you can't, it, it becomes very difficult for you to apply a truth or to, or, or, or to name what's going on if you don't know where you are, if you don't know what's going on. And so yes, during this season, read the word of God, but also take time to read your own heart and have God's community come in and help you read where your heart is wandering because your heart is either moving toward Jesus or away. There's no neutrality in the gospel. And then here's where we end is rehearsing. Rehearsing. Prayer partners, would you guys come on up? We're gonna close here and I gotta tell you this about rehearsing. Um, there, there's this, this thing that I've been learning that it's so important to rehearse the truth to ourselves, especially if we want to experience God with us. So remembering is important. Reading the word is important and reading yourself is important. But like rehearsing the truth in live time is crazy important. And here's what I mean by that. Like, I'm um, very practical and some, I don't know, like I don't always get super practical with you, but super practical how this is working out in my life is, um, there's phrases that I have on point that I rehearse throughout the day, especially when I feel it rising up, whatever it might be for you. One of the phrases that I rehearse on, to myself after I've read where I am and where I'm headed in my head and, in, and usually sometimes in my heart is Jesus, you've got this. I know that like may not be like crazy insightful <laughs> but you will see me saying that to myself all day because I'm realizing I'm like super hopeless and I'm so quick to think that I've got a shred of hope in me that I've got to continue to rehearse Jesus you've got this Jesus you've got this And in the rehearsing, my heart, it's like God is actually telling me this through myself. And my heart actually starts to believe this slowly and consistently and not consistently at times. It's like like this three steps forward, two steps back. But the rehearsing has brought me in contact with an accessible Jesus that can touch my hopelessness and remind me there is great, great hope. If you know my four-year-old son, he's not ready to come up here yet and share his story. But there's something I rehearse with him. Um, and I wanna say I, I, li- I want to do it and I like to do it, but I think sometimes it's forced and, I, and, I, and this is what I, we're just, we battle back and forth right now. Have you ever been in a season where you sometimes battle with your kids? I don't know if I'm just, okay, thank you. We're in a little bit of a battle, and so, so I try to rehearse this with him. Um, and it goes like this. I, have I told you today how much I love being your daddy? And um, yes, no, whatever. And, and it was just recently he said, in his own way, uh, have I told you how much I love being your son? And it was like, man, the power of rehearsal to win a four-year-old's heart is at work in a 45-year-old's heart because I love being his son. And it's only when you rehearse that to me in community and I rehearse it to myself over and over and over again that I begin to thrive in this thing we call hope. So we're gonna close and man, we've got prayer partners who wanna just pray hope into you. They want to rehearse stuff over you in prayer, and we're going to sing over you, and so we're going to close our time with an opening for you to come forward. If you need some hope, man, let us pray that for you, into you. Ask the God of hope to give you that, and then uh, we'll all close together in, in in a community prayer. Our last slide, go ahead and throw that up there. Hope is a dangerous thing. It's from the Shawshank Redemption. 
Hope helps us to remember more is yet to come. Amen? Amen. Now may the Lord God of hope bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you a hope that is radical and unexplainable outside of Jesus and Jesus alone. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. Love you. Take a moment to remember who God is and who I am. There you go, lifting my load again. Take a moment to remember who God is and who I am. There you go, lifting my load again. There you go, lifting my load. Jesus, yoke is easy, burden is so light. No longer am I held by the yoke of this world. Come up under the yoke of Jesus. This yoke is easy, this burden is so light. This burden is so light.